Okay, so first I'd of course like to say thank you for having me here today. And what I'm going to do is talk a bit in direction of how do we generate some of the large scale data resources that we need in order to carry out discovery in child and adolescent mental health. And I'm gonna show some models that have worked for us over the years in the imaging community, which really are, are extending uh, into other communities as well. So for starters, I will say that most of what I'm gonna say, if you wanna read it, it, there's actually one piece we wrote in uh, ADAA's journal, and then there's a more down-to-earth lay version in Spectrum uh, online. So either of those two will really take on the challenge I'm gonna delineate, which is relatively straightforward. How do we find clinically useful biomarkers, in particular and with my interest, using brain imaging? Now the thing is, this isn't a new quest, this isn't a new goal. This goal has been around for decades. And so really one of the things that really tried to, to flesh out in these pieces is what's changed? What are the advances? And there's, because the, the thing is, there is no single game changer. And that's one of the things we really have to start off by accepting is it's, but what we are seeing is there are a constellation of changes and advances in the community that are giving us optimism. And I'm gonna highlight a few of the changes in thinking uh, and then what I'll do is show you an example of a resource we're building, which I think embodies a lot of these uh, ideas. And also, I think you'll see has a lot of similarities in thought and flavor to what being, has been discussed. Okay, so what's one of the major changes going on in mental health? Well, it's this redefining of, uh, it's this changing of gender. You now hear open acknowledgement. In fact, we need to step away from DSM. We need to step away from these classic diagnostic categories, which serve us still well clinically as far as being reliable with one another, and at the same time maybe setting us back from a research perspective. Because it, it's widely acknowledged there's an incredible amount of heterogeneity, which in this now increasingly classic slide, uh, they're, they're showing is you have a lot of heterogeneity within any diagnostic category. And we also know that, that there are links across the categories. So if you take that step back and you say, Instead of relying on DSM, where we're defining things behaviorally and as such really have no expectation that's going to match the underlying biology, let's go about defining it from the biology, from the neuroscience. And that's where you start getting the challenge scoped out of, okay, we're going to take a broad range of individuals, a particular domain of illness or a range of domains, and get a broad range of data measures and use advanced analytics to actually go and sort folks based upon the biology to find out what are those two uh, true clusters, those true categories. That has actually been a changing in philosophy that's taken about, I'd say, five to eight years to really uh, make its way into the biological psychiatry community. And the community is still trying to figure out how to fully implement it. But this change, this step back and not being overly married to DSM is really an important piece of moving forward. Another part is really the, and this year the prior speakers have made it easy for me, is really honing in on this idea of precision medicine uh, for psychiatry. Over the last half decade or so, you see the word precision medicine coming up in field after field in medicine. In psychiatry, it's uniquely challenged. Why? Because psychiatry remains the only field of medicine where we don't have objective measures of illness. And so that is a unique challenge. As you can see from the speakers today, there is an increasingly broad range of, of markers that can be considered. But, but really, precision medicine, this idea of stratifying individuals based upon risk, based upon some set of markers, and being able to say, well, based upon this set of markers, that one person has one prognosis and another has you know, this other prognosis, or are you more likely to respond to drug A versus drug B? This stratification of individuals is really it has worked in elsewhere in medicine, and it does have promise for psychiatry, but there's an incredible amount of foundational science that needs to go into it in order to find these markers. Beyond really what we're trying to accomplish, it comes out to about the question of how. And this is just a short list of an increasingly broad range of modalities that can be used. And I think this figure here to the right is always one of my favorites uh, from Builder and Poldrack. And you've seen variants of that figure in, in different talks today. In this case, they're basically identifying uh, seven different ohms, of course, so wrapped around it is the envirome. And the idea that we have the multiple level of, of omics. And when we look at how we design studies, so often we hone in on a single level. It doesn't make sense if we all agree that illness is multifactorial, that measurements are probably gonna be, uh, require integration information, we don't design studies this way. And what you'll notice is up top we have MRI, EEG, some of your classics, 
eye tracking, and you start seeing voice and language samples, genetics, actigraphy, deciduous teeth. That's something we've been recently introducing to one of our initiatives, where you're taking baby teeth, because actually the baby teeth can be processed to identify metal exposures from the perinatal period. And then comes one other piece. So if we have this increased focus on neuroscience, this increased focus on precision medicine, and an acceptance that we need to really go broader in scope, the next piece is leveraging open data sharing. And I'm gonna harp on this for just a couple minutes because I think this is really an important piece, and especially as folks are thinking about scoping out a research institute. This is something that Child Mind, we had to go through about seven years ago when I went there on what's the research, what's the defining themes of research agenda, and how do we have more global impact? And the answer is open data sharing and open science. And what you're seeing here is a range of open data sharing initiatives that we've launched over the years through something that umbrellas it called INDI, the International Neuroimaging Data Sharing Initiative, where in the brain imaging community, a community where people struggled for 20, 30 data sets to, to get a hold of to analyze, we now sh openly share over 15,000 data sets. And in these initiatives, most of them, what we were actually doing is going to sites around the world and saying, give us the data set you have. So for example, we had the 1,000 Functional Connectomes Project back in 2009, which launched Indy. And there we took, across 33 sites, we were able to pull 1,300 data sets, uh, functional MRI and MRI, and structural, and openly share them with the community. And then we went into ADHD 200. We went to six different sites, pulled together data sets from six different sites to, to release 900 data sets, about a third of which were children with ADHD. And then the Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange, or ABIDE, it actually just recently had its second round. Where in each round, 1,100 data sets are being accumulated, half with autism, half without, and openly shared with the community. So now the community can operate off of 2,200 data sets, half with and half without autism. And these data sets are being pulled from institutions around the world. Core, one of the key issues in science is hearing about difficulties with reproducibility and reliability, and you hear these crises. And a lot of it goes down to poor sample size and also poor rigor. Someone comes up with some measure that, that they get excited about. They don't actually put it to the base test of a biomarker. Do you have test retest reliability? So we pull together a large scale data set that consists of actually a range of test retest designs from independent investigators, openly share that. And then we have data generation initiatives like the NK Rockland over at the Nathan Klein Institute where we have a, a sample from ages 6 to 85 over, actually now it's about two, up to about 1,500 individuals with comprehensive phenotyping, comp multimodal imaging, comprehensive assessments, all openly shared with the community. Uh, the Healthy Brain Network I will talk a bit about because that one there embodies a number of the design issues that I'm going to suggest towards the end. And then uh, one of the most recent is the Primate Data Exchange. We're in the non-human imaging community. We're actually helping to mobilize them and encouraging them to openly share. And we just actually had a release, uh, which was recently described in Neuron, where that pulled together a couple hundred data sets in a community where people are analyzing two or three data sets and basing a variety of, of findings on such a limited sample. And those are some of the most difficult data and some potentially arguably some of the most valuable. And so we've really been helping folks to, to get into the spirit of open sharing as a way of advancing the science. Now, the obvious question that comes up is, does it matter? So what we recently did is we have a paper in Nature Communications where we went back to our data, to, we turned to the literature and asked, can we show that matters? What you're seeing on the left is basically a publications generated using a, a set of consortia, uh, several of which I described. Basically, these are efforts that are using data that we've shared and publishing. As you can notice, there's a rapid rise in the imaging community. At present, I mean, this data is actually only as of early 2017. At present, there's well over 1,000 publications that have come out. If you look at initiatives like the Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange, right now there are two publications a month coming out using the data that was shared through uh, the Abide. Another key thing is, it's not gonna be, the answer for how to best analyze your data is not gonna come from a psychiatrist or a neurologist or a neuroscientist. I myself, my background, I'm a child adolescent psychiatrist, also a cognitive neuroscientist by, by doctoral training, and I also had an undergrad in computer science. I'm pretty confident in my analytic skills, and I can also tell you they're limited compared to one of the best data intensive analysis folks coming out of Hopkins or places like that in the current day. But I do know I can speak with those folks and I can help define questions, and that's an important piece but I want them using the data. And the thing that we see is when we share a data set on ADHD or we share a data set on autism, we actually set their agenda for analysis. They have great methods and they need questions. 
And what you're seeing here is the range of journal types that these data sets we've that we openly shared are, are com that people are publishing in, essentially. So even though psychologists, neuroscientists, or psychiatrists are ones generating the data sets, if you notice, you see mathematics, you see engineering, education, computer science. There's a broad range of folks taking these data sets and using them to advance methods and analytic techniques. Importantly, it's not just publications. When we looked at our analysis, there were 56 theses, a um, combination of master's and doctoral theses that have, have been published using uh, data that, that have been openly shared, also taking on a key challenge when folks try to claim that what's happening is open data sharing is going to hurt the young investigator. It's actually quite the opposite. Uh, and one other thing is when you look at who's publishing, folks who contributed to the data set or those who went and downloaded it, the truth is, it's the vast majority are coming from people who were not the data generators. That, that means we are actually expanding the scope of the scientific workforce, which is incredibly important in child and adolescent psychiatry, where you know we have a very limited workforce. And so that's where the open data sharing is essential. And one key thing that we noticed is, if you look at the folks who contributed data, it's not like they're contributing without getting back. If you look at the sample size of their studies, they're actually significantly larger uh, than they would, what they would have been otherwise. One final thing is down there, uh, you're seeing a plot of, basically you're, everywhere you see a circle, it's from Google Analytics style analysis showing uh, people who are an author on one of these papers. You're seeing where researchers are, and then those lines you're seeing are actually lines showing co-authorship on papers. So you're seeing a global community working with each other. One other thing that we also did is we said, what's the impact of sharing? Well, the impact of sharing if you break it down, it comes out to what's the cost of, what would, what would have cost to do the research that was carried out using these openly shared data sets? Low bowl estimate would be about $800 million, higher estimate about $1.7 million. And then the other thing is, what are scientific advances that we're seeing? So this here was the announcement paper for Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange. For years, we'd seen a community saying, Autism Brain is hyper-connected. No, it's under-connected. Which one is it? And we basically showed it's both. It depends what parts of the brain are you talking about. And we were able to do it in a way that others can go take that same data, replicate, build off their findings. That's a key thing. And then actually one other one just related to the theme of today is there was one investigator up in Montreal who downloaded and then got a hold of us and had us help him with some analyses that he carried out where he actually showed subtyping of individuals with autism in the abide sample based upon brain structure. And what he showed is, if you look for brain behavior relationships with something like the ADOS, one of the research tools to measure autism-related autism symptomatology, well, you do better if you actually look within, a, if you actually subtype individuals and look for these brain behavior relationships rather than just putting them all together. And that goes, of course, with one of the themes we heard from folks earlier today about trying to subtype based upon other systems. Okay, so for the remainder of my talk, I'm gonna focus on a data generation initiative uh, called the Healthy Brain Network that we launched back in 2015 at the Child Mind. It probably wasn't a thinking at least for, well, probably since the date I walked in back in 2011. Uh, but I'm gonna show it as an example of a large-scale data initiative that tries to embody some of these principles about really being multimodal, about, about uh, transdiagnostic research, and also open science. Okay, overarching goal of Healthy Brain Network is to create a large scale and equals 10,000 subject transdiagnostic biobank essentially for child and adolescent mental health uh, research. How, how are we gonna do this? Well, this, this would be a much longer conversation, but the summary version of it is, we went through the idea of creating a network of diagnostic centers that we would set up. So the first one in Staten Island, New York, was set up in 2015. The second one we based through CMI over in Midtown East and in about February of this year, maybe March the latest, there will be a diagnostic center set up in Harlem. And what we're trying to do is basically create a high throughput assessment centers. Each one of these centers uh, invites folks to just bring your child in. Are you worried about your child? Come on in for an assessment. Well, what, what are you getting for participating? You're getting a comprehensive assessment, which uh, it's a comprehensive diagnostic report from the mental health side. Initially, we had abbreviated learning evaluations, and then we saw the need from the community for more comprehensive learning evaluations that could be used for gaining accommodations, and, and also for balancing out our perception of mental illness. You know, one of the things we keep focusing on is mental health and physical health. There's another part of the equation, it's called learning. 
And so often mental health researchers don't think about learning. And if you look for associations between learning and mental health, they go in both directions. So not a healthy brain network embodies both mental health and learning. And so any child who comes in is essentially getting back a, a report that would cost them about four to $6,000 to get in the New York area. One other thing about healthy brain network is, oh, well, this here is a project plan. It's one thing I will say, I'm not gonna go into details of it, is we viewed it as an evolving effort. So when we work on the first 500 subjects, we were sitting there setting up protocols and prototypes and testing things out. And then we took the next 500 to say, okay, now let's revise the protocol and let's do it better. And what changes do we need to make? And then we work on scaling it. And right now, currently, we have over 2,500 subjects enrolled. And there's something where on the one hand, all the core protocols are now fixed. On the other hand, we do leave flexibility so that we can really capture some of the best scientific advances as we see coming out. And also that if someone says, hey, maybe you should do something a little differently, here's why, we listen to them and we integrate. Inclusion criteria are designed in, in inclusion incredibly broad. We wanted to sit there and basically include as many children as we can. So often when you look at the research that you, that you see coming out, it's not particularly representative of the clinical populations we're after. If you think about it, you don't need brain imaging for a child with garden variety, simple ADHD. There's, there, there's no value. It's an unnecessary test. But when you talk about more complex presentations and we want to differentiate one form of, of psychopathology versus another and so forth, these are the more severe cases that where we think about imaging in these methods, yet they're typically left out of studies. So we went ahead and actually said we're including everyone that we can. We worked to bring, uh, to handle, based on my prior experiences in NK Rockland, most of our protocols we found could handle IQs down to about 66. So we went and matched that, but then we actually designed a track for kids with lower IQs. Uh, in order to be, make it where it's not unreasonable for them to participate, but at the same time, we, we're keeping things practical for, for what their abilities are and tolerability of the study. Uh, here is an old snapshot from the initial data paper, but it, this still stays relatively true. What you'll find is about half the kids will have some form of ADHD. Why? Because we said, are you concerned about your child? So of course, ADHD jumps in. Uh, we actually, I don't have the plot here, we just worked on it, it was just presented by a, by a collaborator at Columbia showing if you look at, uh, if you rank internalizing to externalizing disorders, and, and then you simply say, I'm gonna look at the population norm for disorder versus the amount we're seeing in HBN, shockingly, you're a little low on the internalizing and you're very high on the externalizing. But this is one of the things that, that, that's interesting about transdiagnostic research is thinking about the broad range of disorders and working through the challenges of how do we find those kids who still don't make it into research? How do we target trying to get more internalizing disorders? Uh, this here is the protocol. It actually comes down to four visits, about a total of 12 hours of assessment. Uh, uh, this is something that's evolved when we were in NK Rockland. It used to be two six-hour sessions. And then we quickly realized families will come back as many times as we asked them to. It's just that they don't want to be there more than three to three and a half hours in a day. So we've evolved the protocol to work through. Here is just a snapshot of the many measures involved in Healthy Brain Network. And we had experience in using informatics as a way of enabling data capture in a way that doesn't make your staff feel overwhelmed and at the same time get, get you good quality data. A lot of it is about being able to automate a lot of the handwork that research assistants do, and that's something we successfully did in NK Rockland and have been able to replicate in the Healthy Brain Network. As I already mentioned, put that, incre that increasing balance on learning so that mental health and learning have an equal presence in the study. Uh, when we find particular disorders like autism, intellectual disability, speech and language disorders, if we find in the initial assessments uh, that a child's at risk for having one of these disorders, we actually have additional assessments that can be carried out in the context of the study to get more comprehensive phenotyping. Fitness phenotyping is a part of the study, so we took the fitness gram and we also added in a treadmill so we could get proxy uh, measures of VO2 max. Uh, some of the work that John was referring to, when you look at the folks back in Illinois, that's where I went to graduate school. So I was always surrounded by the world of fitness and, and its impact on the aging brain. And so that's always been a little dear to my heart and getting me to look over the years at the child's, uh, the developing brain. We also put some innovations like having movie MRI where children lie in a scanner and watch movies. And that's a novel way of probing brain function which is coming out in the imaging community. And by us now including that in our protocols, this, this data has been released for now over a year and it's released on a quarterly basis. So folks are getting hundreds and hundreds of data sets in order to help innovate the methods for how to analyze this data and relate it uh, to varying 
presentations in mental illness. We also have the movies in our EEG protocols as well. We also have some innovations which are beyond the scope of talking about today, but how do you get eye tracking the MRI? Very difficult. We put some tricks into the study so you can actually do it based upon the MRI image. The EEG protocol, I will say folks, MRI studies were often guilty of not being practical. Uh, MRI is incredibly valued in a number of ways. At the end of the day, it would be great if we could translate uh, our findings into EEG, something that's more tenable in an office environment, and that's something that, that we really have put a major focus on the acquisition of EEG and actually simultaneous eye tracking. So inherently now, the Healthy Brain Network is producing one of the largest databases of EEG and eye tracking for the community as well as brain imaging. Uh, and one of the exciting things about EEG, I should say, is that methods for doing source localization, for taking these scalp patterns and actually inferring what's going on in the brain are, are improving and continue to improve. And I think that will help drive, you know, that, that will help drive more tenable applications over time. So this is an exciting feature for us. We also took on, and just a couple more minutes, I'll be done. Uh, we took on the issue of how to improve phenotyping for purposes uh, of population studies. A lot of your studies are purely about uh, looking at, at weaknesses in an individual. Jim Swanson, many years ago, designed the SWAN. Uh, it was, it's, a, it's a questionnaire that actually probes for our strengths and weaknesses. So it's not just about how poor are your attentional skills. You could actually be very good. We went and worked with Jim Swanson and Giovanni Saloom down in Brazil and folks at CMI. We put together extensions called the eSwan, which are openly available online. So now we have it for disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, social anxiety disorder, depressive disorder, and panic disorder. And it, it, it really takes on some fundamental uh, analytic issues that, uh, you know, it's its own conversation. But I think that, that was an important piece that we took on. And then the last two pieces I'm just going to point out is another thing is the actimetry. So we went doing some initial testing and settled in as on the actographs uh, as really what we thought was going to be the best for the level of deployment that we're using in order to get data from the, from the environment about folks moving, sleep patterns, uh, or so cardiac measures. So every subject in Healthy Brain Networks wears uh, the actograph for about 30 days, and we get all that data. And finally, what's being launched next month is one of our scientists has developed a, really a, plat a mass platform for data uh, acquisition uh, based upon apps. Uh, so using iPhones, uh, Androids, it's, it's actually uh, platform independent. He's developed an assessment system that could be used so that children can be probed or adults at different times of the day asking for information. How are you feeling? You know, are you, how is your sleep? a range of questions that we've taken from prior studies at National Institute of Mental Health, and we will be deploying that in the next month so that we could now start getting some more longitudinal information over the course of a one-month period along with those actographs. So you could get much richer characterizations. Uh, one of the problems with imaging and a lot of your biological analyses is not just the biological measurements. It's actually all the ca behavioral characterizations that are being used, and I think John's talk, as well as Terry's, really highlighted some of the values of, of these style measures. When you're talking about devices and, and sensors and apps, and that, that's really going to be a way of improving the quality of our research and actually getting ecological valid or more accurate measures uh, of what's going on. Uh, all the data is openly available through a scientific uh, data sharing par uh, portal, uh, which is part of, of Indy. And other than that, just obviously this is a pretty large effort, so many involved. So I want to properly credit.